If you've been watching this channel for a while, you know it's no secret, I am a pretty big fan of terrible books. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Part of it is just, I find them fascinating, and whenever I read something where I'm like, oh man, I could have done better than that, it does make me imagine something better in my head. But probably a bigger reason for it is that sometimes books are just bad in a way which makes them hilarious. You know, the same way that movies like The Room are really, really funny, even if they're horribly put together and have, you know, bad acting and all that. Dude, you're just a chicken. Chip, 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 chip. <laughs> what a story, Mark. They're still really enjoyable to watch. Well, there's a lot of books that are the same way. And if you've been watching me for a while, you know I cover some of those. Like, a lot of my super long, in-depth book reviews are over series that are really, really bad, but I still find them enjoyable to read because they're just so bad that they become funny. You know, they're just so crazy in specific ways or just so odd that I can't help it. They're really fun. And it's been a really, really long time since I did any sort of recommendation video, so I figured, why not? Let's, uh, let's just talk about and recommend some really bad books that are just so bad they become funny again. You know, they, they're so bad they become enjoyable. Uh, now, keep in mind on this, I'm not including books that are funny on purpose. I'm including ones that are 100% sincere in what they're doing, and they are trying with all their heart to make you take this seriously and to make you think, okay, like, I'm, I'm invested in these characters and this situation, but they just fail at it and it becomes really funny again. And I've, I've talked about most of these before, but you know, I figured, why not? Let's bring them up again all in one place so people know where to find them. The first book series I want to talk about is Elixir by Hilary Duff. And yes, that is the girl from the Lizzie McGuire show. She wrote a series of young adult novels. If you want to check out my thoughts on it, uh, you can. But basically, the plot of this is that the main character girl, whose name is like Clea, 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 I don't know, whatever. Whatever, however you say that. Um, she is a reincarnation. Like, her boyfriend 500 years ago drank the elixir of life, and so he's immortal, and every hundred years she is reborn, and then her and him meet, and they fall in love, and then she dies horribly before they have a chance to be together. And believe me, we'll, we'll get to the, how that's been done before. But, you know, and Clorox is like really upset about this, and she's like, oh my gosh, we need to break the curse. And she's also like, wait, we need to find my dad, because my dad went missing while looking for the elixir of life. And there's just so much crazy stuff in here, I can't cover it in just a couple of minutes, but it is a beautiful pile of shit, let me tell you. For starters, the story just makes no sense and is riddled with holes, but they're holes that are funny in a weird way. Like, for example, like I said, uh, Cleveland is looking for her dad at the beginning of the series because he disappeared, but then later on they get evidence that he's still alive and they're like, and you think as a reader, okay, the next book is going to be them following this lead and trying to find him, but then the next time they even mentioned Clalys' dad is when she's at his grave and she's like, I miss you, dad. I'm so upset. And I'm like, Clamshell, you're an idiot, okay? Why are you... I don't know. I don't get it, but it's just stupid. There's another group of characters who basically get psychic powers by thinking really hard <laughs> because this is like an anime now all of a sudden. Uh, none of the magic is explored or explained in any real way. The characters are dumb, <laughs> I guess is a polite way of putting it. Uh, like, they just have n very little to them in most cases, and when some little bits of personality shine through, it's mostly them being dumb and making dumb decisions and going off on wild tangents. It's, it's really fun. The villains are absolutely pathetic, but again, pathetic in a fun way. Like, there's a villain who literally just writes in his journal, I am evil, here is my evil plan, and then another character finds it, and that's how they learn he's evil. Like, it's it's a beautiful mess. Like, they're not particularly long books, and they are obnoxious at a few points, but overall, they are very much worth it. The next one I have is Jesus Christ Zombie Killer, or the full title is actually Jesus Christ colon Zombie Killer colon Book of John. Uh, but, you know, either way, I have, like, a physical copy now. And, um... This one is about Jesus and his friend John the Baptist fighting a necromancer who's trying to raise an army and take over the world. And look, man, I tell you that and you think that sounds really stupid, but it's stupid in a fun way. And that's pretty much it, yeah. 
And I will say, this book is not terrible in terms of execution. Like, in terms of, like, the actual execution, the author clearly is competent. She knows what she's doing. Like, there is an actual story here. Like, there are events that lead into one another, and the pacing is pretty decent. The characters mostly have actual personalities, uh, and they interact with one another, have interesting relationships. Uh, the action scenes are halfway decent. Like, it's a well-written story. It's just the overall concept is so silly that even when it wants me to take it seriously, I just can't. I cannot do it. It's Jesus fighting a necromancer, man. And if that sounds like any sort of fun to you, check it out. And I, and I know you may be thinking, well, okay, this was funny on purpose. I really don't think it was. I think this was meant to be taken 100% seriously because it, if it is meant to be a parody, it plays it totally straight. <laughs> Let me tell you, like, it stares at you and it does not blink. So if it's a parody, it's a very well-disguised one. So Elixir by Hilary Duff really started my love story, let's say, with celebrity books because they're always just so bad and so self-indulgent and th there's a really good look into the minds of these people and a lot of them are completely disconnected from reality. So that brings me to our next So Bad That It's Funny book, which is Zabiba and the King, and that one was written by a fellow named Saddam Hussein. <laughs> That's not a joke, by the way. If you have not seen my video on this, Saddam Hussein really did write this thing. And um, it's not actually that crazy in terms of the events of the story. It's basically just a trashy romance novel. It's like this king meets a peasant woman who lives nearby, uh, apparently like right outside his palace. It's like a 10 minute walk. It's, I don't know, it's not described well. Uh, and then they start talking to each other and they fall in love. And th there aren't a lot of crazy events, like I said. And the characters themselves are definitely really cringy self-inserts. Like, Saddam Hussein has two separate self-inserts in here. You'll have to read for yourself if you want to know what I mean by that. Uh, but it, the events and the characters aren't that nuts. Uh, but there are moments like that, you know? Because a lot of the story is just Zabiba and the king. And the, the king gets a name, but it's not put... You, you don't learn it until like a third of the way through. You know, it's not a stylistic choice. Saddam just is a shitty writer. <laughs> And, um, anyways, it's mostly Zabiba and the king having really long philosophical discussions and really long discussions about how politics should work and the best way to run a country and things like that, which is boring, but then the narration will come in with some, like, absolutely wild out-of-nowhere shit. Like, there'll be more than a page where Saddam is just fantasizing about how beautiful Zabiba's mouth is, in a way which is clearly not intended to be sexual, but very much winds up seeming sexual. Or th there's another point where he uh, takes a moment to talk about how bears would have sex with a human man. It's, it's very strange, man. As funny as all that is, though, like, it's not a very good book, okay? Let's be clear on that. But it is a fascinating insight into the mind of Saddam Hussein, and it does really make you sit there and wonder, wow, this, this exists. <laughs> like, you know, that, that's where a lot of the comedy comes from, is just the fact that it exists. Next up, we have Doppelgangster, and I mean, just look at the cover, man. Like, <laughs> look at this thing. It, it's hilarious, and it also has nothing to do with the events of the story. It's uh, about a girl named Esther Diamond, who has, uh, th this is actually the second book in a series, but they're all pretty standalone. You don't really need to read the first to understand what's going on here. But she has gotten involved in a hidden magical underworld that exists uh, in our real world, you know, like ch pretty typical urban fantasy stuff. Uh, and she's just helping to solve a variety of mysterious murders. You know, it's mostly murders of mobsters, but Esther is still really into the solving of it and feels bad for them for some reason, which she probably shouldn't. This one is a little weird as well, because at times it's clearly intending to be funny, and it succeeds at a lot of those points. Like, there are points in here where I was laughing along with the book rather than at it. But then there's also a lot of points which are clearly meant to be taken seriously, and I was, like, in stitches. Those are twice as funny as all the parts that are intended to be funny. Like, there's just so many weird bits of magic in here and characters reacting in such weird ways to all the situations around them that I, I don't I don't even know how to explain it but I can give an example basically there's a very serious moment near the end of the book where Esther is like attacking one of the villains 
and she's just beating him with a dead chicken. And, like, that's... Uh, what? Like, she's just holding a dead chicken and beating him, and we're supposed to be taking this seriously, but I just couldn't. I was laughing way too hard, and I, I don't know. I don't have a whole lot else to go into. Like, you can see, it's not a, not a very thick book, not a very long one. It's a pretty quick read, I, if I remember correctly, so ch check it out. It, there's, some, there's some entertaining stuff in there. Then we have the Left Behind books. These are infamous, let's say, and I've only read a few of them, but, I mean, again, the storyline in these is not important at all. It's basically about how uh, the Antichrist has come to Earth, and so the Rapture comes, and all the good Christians get taken away to Heaven, and then everyone else has to, like, fight the forces of the Antichrist, and, you know, yada frickin' yada. You, you probably know about Left Behind, at least tangentially, and tangentially? Is that is that even the word I'm looking for here? Is that, is that how that works? Obviously, there's a lot of stuff to criticize here about, like, the way it treats Christians and the way it treats people who are not Christian and the way it treats scripture and how the whole thing just has kind of a mean-spirited feel to it, if I'm being honest, but I'll, I'll be honest, if you set that aside, it's really, really funny. <laughs> like, especially if, uh, as you're reading, you just imagine the actors from all the various film adaptations they've tried to get off the ground that have all failed. Uh, if you just imagine, like, Kirk Cameron and Nicolas Cage and Kevin Sorbo and whoever else who has been in these that isn't famous, like, just imagine all of them going on these adventures. It becomes a lot funnier. And honestly, like, after the rapture happens, things just get so crazy. Like, the United Nations takes over the whole world, and then they decide to, like, build a city in the middle of the desert because Babylon has to be there in order to fulfill the prophecy or something. And then you get, like, swarms of locusts, and then Jesus comes back, and that's by far my favorite bit because he barely talks, and when he does talk, it smites his enemies just, just, just by speaking. He kills all his enemies, which doesn't feel like the sort of thing Jesus would do, but okay. And when he talks, it's specifically only in Bible quotes. <laughs> <laughs> like an action figure. <laughs> it's just, oh god, it, it's beautiful. Like, the later books just are nuts, man. They just go so off the wall and so off the rails. Like, it's it's amazing. Just check them out. Like, if you are able to set aside the fact that, okay, yeah, there's people that take this seriously, and if you're able to set aside the fact that it is balls to, or excuse me, bonkers insulting <clears throat> to large chunks of the population, then I think you'll have a good time with Left Behind. Coming in hot is Maximum Ride after the original trilogy. Now, I've talked about this series several times before. Uh, the basic gist of it is that the original trilogy is really solid, and if it had ended there, I would think much more highly of the series as a whole, but after that it just goes really far downhill and decides to start focusing on, like, environmentalism and stuff. But if I set aside my disappointment from when I was a child and tried reading these and tried taking them seriously and was just kind of upset that they became bad. If I set that aside, they're really funny. <laughs> like, there's a book where they go to Antarctica, and the villain, who I don't think is even given a name, is just, like, a dude who's, like, a head on a stick, and all his organs are in little boxes that are separate, and he's somehow kept alive through all that, and then his henchman is, like, a Frankenstein's monster, and then there's multiple apocalypses that the heroes have to try and stop, and they mostly fail, but then they, the apocalypse that comes and actually wipes out most of the Earth that is never explained. Like, it might be an asteroid or a nuclear war or something, but I have no idea what it is. Uh, there's characters that are just switching allegiances back and forth, and it doesn't make any sense. Uh, there's characters knowing things they shouldn't know, and retconning and contradicting stuff that we learned before, like how in the first three books, uh, Jeb was supposed to be the voice in Max's head who was just feeding her advice, which made sense because he act Jeb would actually know all that stuff, but then in the later books they decide that it was actually Angel, who's Max's younger sister who can read minds, that was feeding her all that information. But that doesn't make sense because Angel's a six-year-old girl and she wouldn't have known most of the stuff that the voice tells her. You know, it just there's so many things like that which get really weird, and one of my personal favorites is actually in Maximum Ride Forever, which is basically the last book, okay? Like, I know there's more that they've written since then, but it they're about Max's daughter, they're not really about her, so I'm considering that more of a sequel series than a continuation, but whatever. Anyways, there's just a character 
who is like dead or comatose or something and in order to bring him back another character has to like attach electrodes to his chest and then shock him alive but by doing so he kills himself that does it's not explained it doesn't make any sense but it's i just there's so many moments like that which are great i mean hell they get a talking dog in the original trilogy which is already weird but then in the later books their talking dog starts growing wings and then he gets married to a regular dog who can't talk it's just i don't know that that feels like getting married to a mentally disabled person when you think about it but I, just, I don't know, there's just so many things in here that if I uh, set aside the fact that I was disappointed that the series went downhill in quality, it becomes really, really funny. So, yeah, um, if you've read the original Maximum Ride trilogy and you just heard that it got bad after that, it does, but I would still recommend at least checking it out a little bit because it's just so, so stupid. Next up we have Save the Pearls, and I did a long, long video on this several months ago which, like, and in that video I also uh, said where you can find some PDF scans of this book if you just want to read them without having to pay for it, which I wouldn't blame you because the first book isn't too hard to find, but the second book is a pain in the ass, so uh, you're welcome, internet. Here's the thing, Save the Pearls is horrible. Yes, it is extremely racist. Yes, it is badly put together, it is boring at times, and it is frustrating <laughs> to read at the very least. But it's also really, really funny. Like, I can't pretend it's not. I mean, it's... <laughs> to put it uh, short, if you haven't seen that video, um, basically, it's about a world where the ozone layer got depleted, and so everyone got skin cancer, and this resulted in black people taking over the Earth. And so now we have, like, the white main character is forced to walk around wearing blackface all the time, because it's blackface, but, like, it's also sunscreen. And then it just it just gets stupider from there. And I'll say right now, like, the opening act of the first book is where most of the racism is, and that's the most unpleasant part of the series. It's still funny at points, don't get me wrong, but yeah, that, that bit is kind of unpleasant. But once you get past that, that's when the story really goes off the rails, and that's when it becomes ten times more enjoyable. Because, I mean, you have characters getting turned into furries, you have uh, the revelation that the main character tried to become a terrorist when she was younger but just decided not to and we, j we just never find out about that until like near the end of the second book. Uh, we have the main character deciding she wants to turn the entire world into furries. We have her uh, realizing she's an Aztec god and trying to bring balance to the earth. It's, man, it is just so out there. <laughs> and then there are the sex scenes which are painful and I largely skipped over them but I don't know, other people may get a kick out of those. It just it's just bonkers, because all of this is meant to be taken 100% seriously. Like, the author seriously thought she was making a statement about environmentalism and a statement about racism, and she, well, she was making a statement, but not the one she intended, because she, she was just an idiot. She had no idea what she was doing, and man, I just, I don't know. If you don't believe me, you can watch my video, but I, I seriously left stuff out. Even though it's a two and a half hour video, I left stuff out. Uh, Save the Pearls. Book one and book two have some really, really great gems hidden in there if you just are looking for something to laugh at. The second to last book I will recommend today is Hades, and that is book two in the Halo trilogy. Now, again, I did this series a long time ago, and you may be thinking, well, James, why would you only recommend the second book? And that's because, well, the first book is really, really boring. Like, that's the worst in the series because, like, nothing happens there. And the third book, there are things that happen, but... They aren't really connected in any way, there's not really a conflict or anything, and it's just not as crazy or as interesting, so I wouldn't really recommend reading that one either. There's a few moments in there that are fun, don't get me wrong, but mostly I would recommend reading the second book because that's the best one because that's where things happen. Like, it's still terrible, but things happen in there. And I wouldn't even recommend reading the first book before you get into it. I would just jump right into the second and then be confused about some stuff because, trust me, the actual explanations are probably more boring and whatever you imagine is more entertaining. Basically, the series is about uh, some angels who come down to Earth to help humans and then one of them, whose name is Bethany Church, <laughs> it's just it's stupid name, stupid name, uh, falls in love with a human boy and then you can guess the rest from there. Like, it's a young adult fantasy romance. It's You understand what's going on. Uh, but in the second book, Bethany gets dragged down to hell, on a literal highway to hell, 
and then she has to try and escape. So, in terms of, like, the actual quality, yes, it is uh, better than the others, just because there's an actual conflict and there's an actual plot and things are happening, but in terms of just craziness, which you can laugh at, it's also the best, because you run into stuff like Satan being called Big Daddy by all the other demons, and he dresses like Doug Dimodome. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm not even making that up, that happens. Or how Bethany meets Nazis in hell, but they're not in hell for all the Nazi shit they did. <laughs> like, I'm not... Trust me, I don't have time to get into that. Or how her friends, like, start fighting possessed nuns up on Earth, and she can just watch them while it's happening. It's... It's beautiful. It's off the wall, man. It is bonkers in the best way, and I love it. Like, I don't want to talk too much more about it, because a lot of it is just, uh, I don't know. It's just more fun if you're surprised by it when it happens, but Hades is by far the best part of the Halo trilogy, because it's so terrible that it becomes a riot. And the last book that is so bad it becomes funny that I'm going to talk about today is Evermore. Now, I'll tell you right now, I have not finished this series yet. As of the time of this recording, I'm partway through book four, but so far it is shaping up to be one of my favorite, so bad that it's good, books I've ever read, or book series I've ever read. Because it, it's reminding me why so many of my really long in-depth book reviews are uh, young adult books, because sure, some of them are bad in a boring way, but a lot of them are bad in an insane way. Like, they just take these really bizarre plot points and these really bizarre world-building bits and these really bizarre decisions by characters and just play them totally straight. And strange things happen throughout, and we're just supposed to go along with it. And I guess if you're into that, more power to you, but I just, I can't. It makes me laugh way too much. Now, Evermore is the exact same plot as Elixir, where there's a uh, man who drank the elixir of life hundreds of years ago, and then he has a girlfriend who keeps reincarnating and dying horribly. And uh, I'll get into more of that whenever I make a review of these, but it's it's very much the same plot as Elixir. Like, Elixir is a total ripoff of this. Uh, but then there's just so much dumb shit in here, which never really leads anywhere. Like how the main character's boyfriend, for a while, has to wear a magical full-body condom whenever they're together, or he might die. I'm not explaining that, you'll just have to find out later. Uh, or how there's just a dreamland they can go to whenever they want, and how they can just manifest stuff whenever they want, like they can just manifest a car <laughs> without even uh, exerting themselves or thinking about it. Uh, or how nothing is ever explained in here, like it's, to the point I'm at, uh, it still hasn't explained why exactly Ever keeps reincarnating. Oh, also, the main character's name is Ever Bloom. <laughs> And her boyfriend's name is Damon August. <laughs> like, just, these are not real names, okay? These, I don't know, but I just, oh god, I, I'm saving so much for a future video, so I just don't want to talk too much about Evermore here, but, oh man, it's amazing. It is one of my favorite bad books I've ever read. I would recommend checking out at least the first one, if you're at all curious. And, yeah, that's it for today. <laughs> There's just a lot of... Oh god, there, there's a lot of books out there that are so bad they're good. Uh, please let me know some more down in the comments. Uh, you know, share them with each other, share them with me, because I always like to read those things. And check out some of the things I brought up today if you're curious. Uh, I appreciate you watching this far, goodbye. Super special thanks to everyone who has watched this far, you've seen the entire thing. Except for the credits, of course. These names here are my Patreon patron people. Uh, the $10 and up patrons are... Apo Savalainen, Olivia Rayan, Brother Santodis, Buffy Valentine, Carolina Clay, Dan Antselievich, Dark King, Dio, Echo, Flax, Great Rebo, Johnny St. Clair, Carcat Kitsune, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Micaphone, Peep the Toad, Roby Reviews, Sad Mardigan, Sillier the Vixen, Stone Stairs, Tesla Shark, Vevictus, and Wesley, and of course, all the other names you see here. These people, they're all great, and if you watch this far, Maybe consider becoming a patron so you can get your name on the list here and also get early access to videos and other stuff. If you don't feel like doing that, you can also become a YouTube channel member, which is like the same thing except worse. And you could also like, you know, rate the video and comment on it and subscribe to help share it around if you don't feel like doing any of that or if you're unable to like, you know, that's cool too, I guess. Um, you're all you're all cool people. I'll, I'll see you later. Goodbye.